I think, do we, we have, what do we, we have anybody in the waiting room, Michaela? We have three people that are listening, but all of our CAC members are in their panelists. Now. Okay, so we might as well go live. All right. Good evening, everybody, um, and and welcome to. Oh, it's Tori. Welcome no, it's to Sam, the. It's Sam. She needs to change her. Oh, it's Sam. <laughs> I can barely see. It says Tori. She needs to change her name. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Anyway, my name is Cynthia Neff. I chair the the hydraulic uh, CAC. I'm happy to be here, especially because tonight we have. Jeff Richardson and some other, you know, members of the staff that are going to take us through the budget, which of course, you know, everyone is always curious about, you know, do we have enough money for all the things we need to do? Um, and so um, we're, we're going to do that. I appreciate everybody making the change to their schedule to do this um, at 630, which works better for everybody else. So that's why we're doing it. Um, so anyway, it's time for me to you know read my favorite thing about the bureaucracy, which I know you guys love to listen to, but this meeting is held pursuant and in compliance with emergency order number 20-A16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. And for however long we decide we love um, Zoom more than getting together in person. The committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are, so you're going to be unmuted and just please say here when you hear your name. Rosemary Miller. Here. John Lewis. Jacqueline Salazar. Jacqueline, uh, Cynthia, Jacqueline texted me and said she'd be a few minutes late. So she's going to be joining us as soon as she can. Okay, Michael Corrigan. Yolanda Speed, me, Kimberly Swanson, here. James Clemenko. Here. And welcome aboard. It's Thank just you. We're glad to have you here. Diantha McKeel. I'm here. John Neal. I'm here. Jane Fogelman. I saw you, hon. I know you're here. Vito Chetta. He's here. Michelle Busby. Bill Love. Here. Sam Strong. Here. And Julian Bivens. Here, but I'm going away. You're the best. Um, the people that are going to be responsible for the public comment is the Places 29 Hydraulic Community Advisory Committee. The opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting are posted on the Albemarle County calendar. Please note that the chat is disabled. If you have questions or comments during the course of this meeting, you should raise your hand using the little gizmo and then whoever is speaking can, will see that you want to ask a question or make a comment. Um, disabled Canada to ask a question, use the raise hand feature. And I think if, if I catch most everybody, we have uh, Jeff Richardson, Nelsie Birch, Emily Kilroy, Michaela Accardi, and Carolyn Schaefer all here from the staff. So we have a lot of, you know, great help here tonight. Um, we do have a change to the agenda. Uh, school board member Kate Eikhoff, who is part of our team most of the time is providing an overview on the Albemarle County School Board funding request for 2022. It seemed to make a lot of sense to include that tonight since we were talking about the budget. Um, so I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve the amended agenda that will include the addition of Kate Acuff's um, presentation. So, so, so moved. So okay. moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, thank you. Okay, now we need to talk about the minutes, the lovely minutes that Rosemary does. Um, they really are good. I don't, you know, sometimes, you know, you get minutes and you don't always read them, but I really do recommend you read these because 
because they're good and she captures really the essence of what happened. So um, hopefully you have all reviewed and read the, the minutes and now um, we need to have a voice vote on approving the minutes as submitted. Does anybody have any changes before we go to the vote? Would somebody like to um, make a motion that we approve the minutes? I move we approve the minutes. Thank you, Bill. Anybody second? I second. Kim, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank aye. you, thank you. We are done. And guess what it's time for now? It is time for the budget review. Are we on time? We're on time. <laughs> at, at this time, I'm going to move everybody over to- hey, Carolyn. I think since we have um, a smaller crowd, I think I think we're good to leave everyone where they're at. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, many of us on the CAC remember when Jeff came to visit the CAC and 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 you know entered after he came here. And so, anyway, it's lovely to have you join us again. And I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule <laughs> to do this. So, Jeff, take it away. Cynthia, we appreciate the opportunity as a staff to be with uh, Board Member McKeel this evening and also Board Member Acuff. Uh, it's an honor to be in the community and uh, we know this is a very active CAC. And so we're, we're excited about our budget process. We've worked really hard and we've worked very collaboratively over the last year with our public school system. And so Emily, I'm gonna pause for a second. <clears throat> Do we, do we have an agenda would, does Ms. Acuff go first or how, how do we go out, how do we go about this this evening, Emily? So the plan was to um, show the local government, we have the local government budget presentation is actually a recording. So all the CACs will have the same content. Um, we're look at us leveraging technology. Um, and then, so we have a short local government budget presentation. And then I understand Ms. Acuff also has um, a short school board, um, school division presentation, and then we'll do sort of a, a joint Q&A discussion to follow. And, and do we, I guess my specific question was, do we allow Ms. Acuff to go first? Dr. Acuff, do you have any time issues? Would you like to go first or would you rather us go first or does it matter? I believe you're muted, Kate. I think since you were presenting the overall budget, I think that makes some logical sense to go first, you guys. Um, and I have very few slides at the end. Okay, and so Emily, we did do a 10 minute video and we're gonna show this for the first time tonight and it will be for all of our town halls so that there's a consistency in our messaging, regardless of the staff members who are present. And if I'm remembering correctly, Emily, it is 10, more, 10 minutes, uh, just a very high level overview, right? Yes. Okay, so Emily, if you'll cue that up and then we'll do sure. that part. All right, and if you can't, if you can hear it, give me a thumbs up. If you can't hear it, um, I guess thumbs down. Hello and welcome to this presentation of the fiscal year 2022 recommended budget. I'm Jeff Richardson, Albemarle County Executive, and I'll be walking you through our recommended budget today. This year's budget theme pulls forward the budget theme from fiscal year 2021, which was respond, recover, recalibrate. The fiscal year 21 budget was a budget in flux. We just didn't know a lot about what last April and May was about, and as well as the next 15 months. So therefore, we had to take a very cautious approach to build our budget using the best information that we had. We've added to that theme for fiscal year 22, the word resilient because this recommended budget is designed to make strategic investments to transform our organization and our community, to make structural changes and alignments that ensure that we're focusing our resources in the right places. As always, our revenue recommendations are guided by our strategic plan, the initiatives which are shown here. The bottom bar that underpins the work of the strategic plan, quality government operations, that fuels our organizational capacity to advance the strategic priorities by investing in a quality workforce and managing our, our financial foundation in a way that sets us up for future success. Along with that, in 2020, we expanded the organization's core values. It now includes community. That means 
We expect diversity, equity, and inclusion to be integrated into how we live our mission. Our work ahead is to realize this value and develop tools and the training to empower our staff to integrate equity into all the work we do. I believe that thread begins to run through this budget. I believe this past year has demonstrated maybe more than any other year the critical role that broadband plays in our lives. It's almost like electricity and water. Earlier this year, the Board of Supervisors approved establishing a broadband affordability and access program using strategic reserve funding. For this coming year, we will, we will continue to support that with additional staffing and ongoing money so that we can address our community needs. In addition, we will also uh, work with our housing policy with investment because our housing policy continues to work toward final editing. We want to put one-time one money, $600,000, into the Affordable Housing Fund to support the housing needs of our community. 1.7 million of our fund has already been previously committed to the Habitat for Humanity Southwood project. Also, there is 1.94 million that remains in the fund for other opportunities that will be identified later. Our board recently adopted a climate action plan. This coming recommended budget identifies one-time funding for project implementation. Also, the upcoming budget uh, invest in transit. Our budget will support the regional transit vision work that will set a roadmap for the transit future. Our community continues to grow and to keep up with these mandates and community priorities. It requires us to invest in our built environment. We've done that in fiscal year 21. We intend to do that going into fiscal year 22. We have been able to, in our capital budget, strategic investments to keep moving forward to ensure that we have the capacity and the equipment to maintain the community's quality of life. Based on the recommendations of our CIP advisory committee, this budget supports the construction of our courts project. We've also set aside funding for transportation leveraging, economic development, public-private partnerships. We will continue to invest in our schools, it's planned expansions at Crozet Mountain View Elementary. Both of these will address system ca capacity constraints. We'll also continue to invest in our parks and trails, notably the opening of Biscuit Run Park. This budget also continues to invest in the Registrar's Office, early voting for primary and election support, we experienced high volumes of customers over this past year, and this probably will continue. In addition, our comprehensive plan, which is the guiding document for one of our busiest policy areas, land use. Also, the state budget is currently supporting the full cost of two family preservation positions within social services at no cost in our FY22 budget. This budget also supports the needs of our regional partners, our nonprofits, the arts and cultural institutions, all of which meet so many of the human service needs in our community. And it also invests in our public safety function. North Garden Volunteer Fire Department is requesting career staff to support weekday daytime coverage. Uh, uh, they are facing similar challenges that we faced a year ago in the Crozet community. This request would take five positions to support, as well as one-time funding to purchase a new ambulance. This budget has also recommended the addition of one additional staff person in our fire rescue training division to address capacity challenges due to increased personnel over the past several years. Within our police department, there has been a shift in how the school division will provide security, and this will create capacity for how our five officers spend their time with a new investment by local government for the equivalent of about two and a half officers we will be gaining 5,000 hours of experienced patrol time that will be invested uh, throughout Albemarle County. This will support our geo-policing work and better connect us with our community, and it will enhance our <coughs> Last year, we originally had recommended implementation of $15 an hour across the board for full and part-time staff, as well as a 2% market adjustment for all county staff. All of this had to be deferred once the pandemic hit. 
I'm pleased that this year that we've been able to put this back into the FY22 recommended budget with the implementation of $15 an hour, as well as the 2% market adjustment. In addition to that, I want to continue our multi-year investment with our systems alignment and process improvement work, both inside the organization, as well as with some of our external facing departments. We will begin to scope a new enterprise resource planning effort. This includes the replacement of the County View system, which is in our community development department. I'm excited about this because this will allow us to be uh, more responsive to our citizen needs over the course of time. We still find ourselves very much in the throes of the pandemic. We, we have approached the one year mark. Fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22 are linked much more tightly than we may have seen in recent years. I'll take a few minutes walking through the fiscal drivers of the budget. We believe that during the course of this coming year, our economy will continue to stabilize. We are going to continue to know a lot more about the long-term impact of the pandemic on our economy, on customer service expectations of the public, and the way we work. The approach for physical year 22 is that it's a year of transition. We believe that the investments we make now will make us more strong and resilient in the future. We start our budgets every year by taking a hard look at our diagnostics. How are we doing? For the past several years, it's been good news pretty much across the board with uh, assessments, business activity, consumer spending, and building activity. This year, Assessments continue to grow on the residential side and residential building activity is strong. Commercial real estate assessments are down five and a half percent. There are other areas in the community that are really struggling. For an example, SNAP applications year over year are up 34%. You may know that this is a federal program for food assistance based on income eligibility. In addition, our tourism and hospitality industry due to travel and gathering restrictions have been deeply impacted. Year-over-year -year hotel room occupancy rates are down 35%. These businesses generate consumer activity and they also supply many local jobs. Finally, our financial management policies, our planning, our conservative and flexible approach over the last 15 months has continued to allow us to judiciously guard our triple triple A bond rating. We are financially very, very strong. Recommended F FY22 budget is balanced at just over $466 million. This is an 85.4 cent tax rate, and that's the same tax rate as this present year. We are not recommending a tax rate going into fiscal year 22. This chart provides an overview of where our revenues are coming in from. And this chart provides us uh, an overview of where our expenditures are going. This is a position change summary. I've mentioned the six firefighters and training position in ACFR. I've mentioned the additional investment in broadband, as well as the state supported family support positions at DSS. I will also point out the 19 frozen positions across county government. That's about 39,000 hours of time that is being held as we continue to monitor our economy. We continue to monitor our workloads, and this hopefully will better position us through fiscal year 22 to continue to make necessary adjustments. Here is the budget development timeline for this year, moving toward a final public hearing on April 28th, the adoption of the budget on May the 5th. All meeting information is posted on our website, and all meetings will be held virtually and in compliance with local and state ordinances. And finally, here is contact information. If you have questions, if you have comments that you would like to share, as always, we would love to hear from you. And I really want to take a minute to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for participating in county government. And that's about a 10 minute overview of the budget. That was 16 slides and we spent about an hour rolling the budget out when we did the recommended budget to the, uh, to the board and uh, to the media. Uh, this is just a condensed version of that. And uh, we wanna use that video for all of our town halls to again, ensure a level of consistency. I'm sure there's questions tonight and I will be here to try to answer any questions that you have. Um, before I do, though, 
Uh, I think that we do want to hear from the school superintendent. Um, Emily, do you want to give uh, that up so that they can get that? Looks like Michaela has it. Thanks, Michaela. Great. Michaela is our go-to for everything. Um, yes, uh, I am not the superintendent, Mr. Richardson, but um, I will, uh, two things, our budget and a more detailed uh, funding request and, and presentation that was made today to the Board of Supervisors is available online. This is a shortened, shortened version of it, but uh, it is designed to anticipate some questions. Um, like the county's budget, we are submitting a balanced funding request. Next. Can, overall, if you look at our um, last year's adopted budget, it was $193 million. Originally, it was 209.6 million. 209 and we, after the pandemic hit, had to cut 15.6 million, which was predominantly by freezing uh, salaries and any kind of raises, uh, freezing positions and not doing any initiatives. This year, we're up to, uh, it, overall, it's an eight point increase, but that is a little bit deceiving, but it's $209 million. Next slide. And if you look at our um, expenditures, you'll see that we're people, education is a people business. 85% uh, of our operating budget is people. It's compensation and benefits. Next. Um, just a, a brief note of our school enrollment numbers. The pandemic had a significant impact. Uh, we had a projected enrollment or we had an actual enrollment of 14,000 in the last school year and this school year, um, the pandemic did a significant number on it and our enrollment was down about 700 uh, and about closer to over 900 if you look at what we had projected it would be because the state stepped in and held us harmless uh, in their per pupil funding we weren't hurt too bad, but it makes an already challenging uh, prediction of what our enrollment will be even more challenging. Um, we are predicting that we'll have in the next school year just over 14,000 students, which we will see if we have that. Next slide. Um, in terms of our increases, you can see again, the compensation is the driver of most of it. We have both funds going to uh, restoration of instructional restoration, as well as operational restoration. Um, and, you know, among these things are restoring the class ratios, et cetera. We have $600,000 worth of new proposals. Um, that includes school safety coaches and an equity expansion. School safety coaches are what we are implementing uh, instead of having uh, school resource officers or members of the police department in our schools. Um, these state safety coaches will get training and get certified in being school safety officers, but their portfolio will be a little more broad than that. Uh, we that will, that accounts for just under $300,000, uh, 250 plus is from, for not funding, bringing back the money that was funding the SROs. And then it will cost an additional amount in part because instead of five officers, we will have eight school student safety coaches. Equity expansion, as You've heard for the past several years that we have a very strong focus on promoting equity in our classrooms, reducing the achievement gap, having anti-racism policy in place. And this represents a three FTE addition to help with the professional development of staff, teachers and staff. Next slide. Um, just a bit, I've got two slides just about compensation. And one of them, uh, the way, teacher salaries are, are set, 
we have about 19 school divisions in our market basket. This is a subset of them. It includes the surrounding communities, well, and the donut hole of Charlottesville, um, plus some other select school divisions. And our target salary is to be in the top 25%. I've asked for a review of our methodology because I'm not certain, because of the chain, Albemarle County, as you all know, has become substantially more urban. Most of our population, most of our students are from urban and suburban areas. And I'm not persuaded that including Rockingham County Schools, for example, does anything other than bring down the 25% target. So we are looking at that, but you can see most clearly our, um, our most fierce competition is with Charlottesville City Schools and we consistently underpay compared with uh, the city. So they are planning a 5% increase. We are hoping to do a 5% increase. We will still be behind on all these metrics. Um, so that is an ongoing challenge. Uh, and I don't think it's one that local governments can get us out of entirely. I think uh, as Gov Governor Northam has, has made the statement, which I agree with, that our teachers generally are underpaid and he would like to raise everybody's salaries by about 20%. Of course, the challenge is identifying a funding stream for that. Next slide. Um, the other thing it, that was delayed from last year, as Mr. Richardson said, is increasing our minimum, minimum wage to $15. Um, we have about 448 of our uh, classified staff. And just, just to give you a point of reference, we have 1,342 teachers and we have 1,172 classified staff. So of that 1,172 classified, we have four, almost 500, 448 that make less than the, the minimum wage. Um, next slide. What are we gonna do about it? Um, first of all, we're gonna raise the pay scale for full-time and part-time regular employees. Uh, we are having to make an adjustment between the VRS, full-time VRS staff and the non-VRS staff because the VRS staff are at 5% higher level of compensation than the non-VRS staff to pay into the retirement fund. Um, so what we are proposing is an increase to $15 minimum for the full-time VRS staff this year. Um, the biggest expense that attends to raising the salary is decompression, uh, the issue of compression of the rest of the pay scale. This increase of uh, probably 350 of our full-time VRS classified staff is gonna cost about two point, uh, I wrote it down, 2.8 million, I think, to do, um, so you have to do the decompression because if you bring, for our lowest paid salary folks who are at $10 and 20 cents, raising them to 15 is a 47% increase and we clearly can't do that all the way up the pay scale. Uh, but we do have to make adjustments to, for years of service, uh, performance, et cetera. So the biggest cost in raising the pay scale is the decompression piece. Um, mm -hmm. But we are uh, planning to do that. Um, next slide. I think that's it. Uh, and I would be available to answer questions about any of the other issues and direct you to where, uh, send you the responses if I don't know them. Cool, am I muted? No, no. you're okay. We can hear you, you're good. Yeah, I don't know why it decided to crap out again. Um, Nelsie, did you have anything that you were going to present or talk about? 
No. No, Cynthia. Hi. I just wanted to introduce myself. I haven't met any of you um, except for uh, Diantha and um, Kay from from our work. Um, or Kate, excuse me, from our work on the budget. But um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm here to help answer any questions that I can. Um, and certainly get my team to provide the answers if there's more technical or detailed questions that I can answer. So thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Okay, so who has a question? Oh, yeah, Bill has his hand. Cool. Bill, go ahead. Okay, my question relates to the county budget. Um, obviously, a, an area of concern nationally has been policing. And so uh, what I'm wondering is if in this current budget that's being planned, if there are any changes that are reflecting some of the concerns that have been expressed about policing. I, I noticed one of the candidates for lieutenant governor is, is using the phrase reimagining policing. And I would think that might include things like training, like changes in the roles of police officers. I don't know if it would affect overall manpower or not, but I, I, it sounds like one thing that may have changed is the relationship uh, with the schools involving school safety. Are there any others that are reflected anywhere in the budget line items? Jeff, do you want to take this? And then I'll ha I have a couple of things I'll add, but you can start if you want. Yes, ma'am. Nelsie, you can help me with this. I think we recently... Uh, Went after you know, we went after a grant for um, um, cameras that uh, officers will use in the field. Um, Nelsie, help me help me help me remember. Um, I can't remember exactly what that's called. It's a uh, yeah the um, the body worn camera uh, program. Yes, um, is, yeah. Is that what you're wanting? Okay. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what I was looking for. So that's, Bill, that's something that will uh, be evolving in the police department. We, we feel like we have an excellent chance at securing that grant. And so we, we will be uh, doing that uh, to uh, help us take another step forward with the, the degree of transparency with all of our uh, community interactions that we have with, uh, with the public. I think that the fact that we were able, Bill, to absorb the $230,000 in the operating budget of the police department to be able to get 5,000 hours of additional police officer staffing in the field, that helps us with our staffing ratios. We have, we have as you know, a very large county, and there are, there are uh, at times when we're very stretched for personnel. So 5,000 hours, which equates to about just over two, two and a half officers, FDE growth, that will help us with our officer staffing in the field. So those, those are two things that come to mind. If Chief Ron Lance were here tonight, he would talk in depth about a lot of the various training hours that he uh, provides his officers uh, on a continual basis. They also, when they go through the recruitment school, and through uh, field training officer observation, they go through an excruciating amount of field assessment uh, with a seasoned officer before they're ever uh, allowed to go into the field, uh, into the staffing uh, uh, by themselves. So I feel really good about the, the things that we've done. I'll stop there and see if uh, Board Member McKeel has anything to add. Bill, I just will um, let everybody know that um, our community, specifically our police department, continued to um, follow the geo-policing model that came out of President Obama's 21st century policing. Many communities across the country stopped that. Um, we have continued it because it has been extremely successful for us. It, our crime has gone down. Uh, geo-policing, of course, you understand is uh, police officers are assigned a neighborhood and get to know the neighborhood. Um, but we've implemented and, and have continued to follow President Obama's, what it's called as 21st century policing. That has been a real um, win for us. Um, I will say also that all of our, uh, not all, we're trying to get all of our, but many of our officers have crisis intervention training. 
And one of the one um, important initiative that um, Chief Lance is working on, and Jeff can, can correct me if I'm misstating it, but um, it's not gonna be implemented this year. It's a work in progress. But what we're trying to do is to get a team together that's specially trained around mental health, that can deal with some of the mental health calls that the police officers are now having to answer. And it's really not an appropriate place for just police officers to be. So we're working on that, but it's not quite ready for prime time yet, to be honest with you. It takes a while. Um, the biggest change is probably, I think, what Kate alluded to with taking the SROs out of our schools, the uniformed officers, and using a different, um, um, oh. <laughs> and, and I don't know if Kate wants to expand on that at all, but Bill, did I answer your question? Yeah, I hope that was you. good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kim, did you have a question, hon? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, so for, you, the, um, for the county's budget, um, I guess I would like to understand a little bit about the 19 positions that have been frozen and like which departments if that's easily understood um, um, are affected and then on um, the school budget my understanding was that prior to the pandemic there was uh, there was going to be a change in the, the CIP calculation for how the per, per pupil funding was determined, is that true? And how did that um, play out this past legislative session and how does it affect the school's budget? I don't know. Kate, you wanna go first? You want me to? Um, Nelsie, you have got the page number in the budget. I, I saw you looking. So yeah. if you could answer the question specific to the positions that are frozen give to give Wants and a flavor for that, and then I'll and anything else you'd like to add, and then I'm going to do some general overview comments as to why those positions are frozen and how we'll be moving into into fiscal year 22 with those. If you don't got mind. it, yeah. So um, if if you happen to to have access to our budget, which is online, it's page 54. But I'll I'll briefly go over that this is a snapshot in time, um, and so we make decisions um, every two weeks. We get together to determine what position is, has become vacant and what other position maybe we should unfreeze that might be a higher priority um, at the time. And so at the time that this book was uh, drafted, there's everything from community development, which has uh, two, three, four, five positions frozen to um, the executive office, to, to my department, to fire rescue, social services, parks and rec. So it really runs the gamut. Um, but again, it's a snapshot in time um, that we're taking those, the, those, those vacancies and using it to help offset um, the needs we have in our current budget. And so it, it will change as we go through and navigate through the FY22 budget. I don't know that I really have a lot to add. That was excellent, Nelsie. Uh, Kim, when we started last spring, uh, we ended up with about 27 positions that were frozen. We held public safety harmless, so we did not we did not freeze any frontline fire positions. We did not freeze any frontline police. We did not freeze any uh, social worker positions uh, with adult protective services, or we did not uh, freeze any inspection positions in the field. Uh, but we did hold some positions, positions open to artificially create reserves because in the first three to four months of this, we had really no idea how bad our revenues were gonna hurt uh, from the, the, the drop in the economy immediately when the pandemic hit. And we've gradually moved some of those positions, as Nelsie said, and we've, we've unfrozen some. We've, we've remained, we remain holding 19, and we're evaluating in every department how that's affecting workloads. And a lot of our employees uh, have had to pick up additional work uh, due, due to all the work from the pandemic that we've taken on, along with all the day-to-day -day operations. So we're watching that pretty close. Thank you for the question. Kate, were you going to add anything? Um, I don't have much to add, Kim. I can try to get back to you. I mean, I know that there's been ongoing lobbying for years to change the SOQs, expand the categories that are covered or the numbers that are covered. That did not happen. 
uh, where we were successful was in the per pupil average daily membership amount was was kept at we were held harmless at with so they paid us even though our census actually dropped um, so that was the main thing that we and many other school divisions were asking to happen thank you kate uh, so we're going to do veto and then john I had a couple of basic questions um the assumption is we collect real estate tax in the county we keep it all is that correct none of it goes to the state is that right uh real estate taxes do not go to the state now okay. we how share it with the school how about sales tax um, sales tax is remitted to the state and then comes back to us. Um, and so it's really a processing, a processing thing, but, um, the state has their portion and we have ours How big and it all goes to the state and then funnels back to us. And what percentage of that comes back to us? Um, it, it I, I have, I, I do not know that answer in terms of sales tax of, of what, of what comes back to us. Maybe half of it. Is it that much? Um, I, I have, I, I do not know, but I can absolutely get you some details on that video. And, and, then, and also the schools, the state contributes to the school system, correct? Correct. And do they contribute to us relative to our, our financial status? And do poor, poor counties get a lot more per student than, than we would get? There's different funding streams for from the state. I mean, one of them um, is based on the composite index, which is an indicator of the wealth of a community. Diantha, you can jump in and help me here. Uh, and then they contribute in terms of the average daily membership. And then any of their other, I think most of their other contributions are dedicated funds for a certain use. So they're not in the general revenue pile. Yeah, so you hear Vito sometimes about the lottery funds. And I think Kate, the lottery funds are what $2 million, anywhere between one and a half and $2 million. So if you think about the size of the budgets, that's really not uh, a, a lot of money. Uh, people tend to think that the lottery funds are paying for a lot, but they really are not. Um, and Kate's right, the composite index is a community's ability to pay. So the money channels through the composite index so that a, a really poor county has a different composite index than we do and would naturally get more money. But at, at the same time, you have to realize that Virginia is one of the states that is at the bottom of the 50 states of supporting schools. I think that's fair to say, Kate, still. Right. We were, we have been losing ground. I don't know if we're 48th or 49th. I mean, it depends on how you look at it, of course. Yeah. I mean, we are, our teachers are paid less than the national average. And if you take out Fairfax and Arlington, we're in the bottom half a dozen states in the country. And if you look at our income as a county versus how much we pay our teachers, we're dead last in the country which is not a place I enjoy being, but there's challenges to getting there. I guess the other, the state pays a composite index, the average daily membership. And then when they say, oh, we're going to pay 5%, we want a 5% increase for teachers. They only pay for part of a certain number of positions. Every single county, every single school division in the state has staffs at a much higher level than the standards of quality. So they only pay for, you know, if, if you're supposed to have 50 teachers, but you really only have, a, you have 100, they will pay a, a subset for 50. And so one of the area, so it's very misleading when they say they're going to pass a 5% 5 per, 5 teacher pay because they don't pay a quarter of it. Mm. Probably not even that much. Uh -huh. And, and Vito, I can add, um, I just did find that we get one cent from every five, for the five cent uh, tax rate. So 20% is what comes back to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know just for fun, Nelsie, that I asked one time, what business 
what gave us the most income from sales. And I was fascinated because I was told it was grocery stores. And if you think about it, uh, Lori told me that one time, she said, if you think about it, they're open all the time and it's cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. <laughs> so you want grocery stores. <laughs> okay, Mr. Lewis. Hi, thanks for your time. Um, first of all, this is less of a question and more of uh, comments. But first, I really appreciate the well-written budget and um, happy that you haven't raised the tax and, and I'm confident that you guys, we have, I live in a very well-run organization. So thanks for all the work that you do. Um, I represent and try to always advocate for bicycling and pedestrian activities. And I'm happy to see that the CIP program has prioritized opening biscuit run through the beginning of the building out the parking lot. Um, so really my question is around when is biscuit going to open? Um, and uh, but though I fully understand that you are prioritizing it, I think what I really want to see more of uh, is more funding to connectivity of neighborhoods through non-car means, if you will, so bike ped. And I know that you do have some funding in there allocated this year, certainly from the CIP perspective. Uh, but I, I just ask that you consider more for certainly around the urban neighborhoods, connecting them, making them more livable and increasing tourism. And then finally, I, uh, I very much support having any kind of funding you can support a, a bicycle path that connects Crozet to the new tunnel in the mountains to Charlottesville, and ideally all the way to Richmond to extend the Capitol Trail. I think that would be an amazing tourist opportunity and put Albemarle on the map since it's a destination uh, in a way that Richmond is as well. So again, thank you for all your support and just as as I always do, and everyone's smiling, but I ask for more. Make it make it easier for us not to have to use a car. Thank you. So, uh, if somebody else has a question, you can raise your hand. But I had a, a couple. Um, you know, in the chart you had, Kate, that talked about this is how many kids we had. There was like a thousand kids missing between what was there and what became. Where where did they go? Do we know where the kids are or? or were they just staying home? I think you're on mute again. You're on mute. Sorry. We don't know exactly. What what you can what we in looking at the numbers, we the enrollment this year versus last year, there's about 800 fewer, 700 and change fewer kids. Um, let me see what my number is. Of those, 87 percent were in elementary schools. And of those, 25% were in kindergarten. So some people, I believe, just kept their kids home for an extra year. We do know that there were some slight increase in you know, homeschooling requests. Some of them, I suspect, when we are getting letters saying, are you going to open next year? We have to make a decision about private schools. So we did lose some to private schools. Um, we had, let's see, high schools, we only lost 93. We have 4,000 people in high school, 93 fewer. I mean, it's all down to the younger kids who are the most vulnerable to learning loss. And they're the ones where the, we're concerned about them all, of course, but. Um, but do, do we, we have a plan where we're gonna try to figure out what happened to them? Right, and there's a, our, our staff, I don't know the answer. I think our staff has done a lot of community outreach to try to find that answer, find out how many are planning to send their kids back to school in the fall. Um, and I don't know. So I'm not, I think more about, we don't know where every kid went, but there are people in the division who know more than I do about where they did go. Um, it's just I, troublesome when you think of it on a broader scale that, you know, there's everywhere the, you know, there's just kids who just kind of disappeared into the, the darkness and, and it's like at some point we have to find them all and, you know, try to get them back. Well, uh, of the kids who've enrolled, we're very aggressive in terms of connecting with those yeah. families, making sure we understand why they might not be logging in uh, for their classes if they're hybrid, I mean, if they're remote. Um, so we're doing a good job with that. It's those who didn't enroll yeah. that we don't know. And yeah. we don't know 
uh, two years ago, we had an extraordinary increase, like 90 more students in kindergarten at Mountain View, than we, which was 70 more than we predicted. So we don't know what to expect in August with the start of school with, um, you know, 200 kindergartners not showing up this year. Are we going to have a gigantic yeah. kindergarten class going forward? We just don't know. We're working on that now, though. Well, that then leads me to my other, you know, which I, I feel responsible for always bringing up whenever we have people from, you know, positions of power in the outside is that that th this district, the Jack Jewett district and the hydraulic CAC is unique in that, you know, we are not about, you know, building, you know, preparing, you know, stuff out in Crozet and, you know, North Garden and all these, you know, kind of investments in development. I mean, this is an old neighborhood. We are the, you know, we, we are where the people of color live, where the people who rent houses live, where the people who don't have fancy new cars, where people, you know, are, you know, are trying to get by, where people, you know, don't, you know, go to Food Lion looking for bargains because they can't afford food. That's why we have loaves and fishes, you know, you see here. And it's just, I think sometimes it feels like that we look at the other CACs in the rest of Albemarle County and, and they're, they're looking for something to, I mean, we need to reinvest in this community, not just build and develop. And, you know, and I think as John was saying, wherever John Lewis went, that, you know, if you, you drive back in some of these roads or these houses and it's just like, they're, they're just abandoned, you know, that the roads don't look like they've been kept up and stuff. So I, I just think at some point we need to remember that all of Albemarle County is not the same, that we have dramatic differences. So, you know, I just, I mentioned that for what it's worth. And the last thing is, can I bitch about the trash? I've already bitched to, to Diantha about the trash. I know that, you know, the guys aren't coming out from jail, but we need a strategy. I mean, the the, the roads are getting covered in trash, you know, and, and waste people throwing out. I want to implement a thousand dollar fine for throwing trash out of your window in the car. But anyway, that's just part, part of what I do. Who's got a question, a real question, not just bitching like me. <laughs> Cynthia, can I, can I answer one of the questions? Sure. Um, I, I know John's not on here anymore, but uh, for the minutes, um, we were able to find that Biscuit, Biscuit Run is slated for substantial completion by July of 2022. Um, so I did want to provide that information. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll be appreciative. Jane, are you muted? There you go. I can't hear you, hon. It says you're not muted. Uh, Michaela, do we have any idea? It looks like she's unmuted on my end. Yeah. I, I'm assuming it's an audio connection through her computer, but I'm not sure. I'm sorry, but we can always follow up with you. Yeah, we can't hear you. We'll have to come back. Anybody else? You're going to not take advantage of this? Somebody must have some burning issue. Okay, uh, Diantha. I just wanted uh, to. Say, uh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kim, and then I'll I'll say. Well, okay. I will I will ask. Um, what if anything is happening that we are at all aware of with this part of the county being in a um, opportunity zone and going forward? Does the county maybe Mr. Richardson is aware of how? opportunity zones are sort of working or not working throughout the country. And if there are any good examples, how being in an older uh, developed portion of a, of a community, do opportunity zones really actually do something? And is the county looking at the opportunities that could come from an opportunity zone designation? Kim, good question. 
I think that um, Roger Johnson, our director of economic development and his team, they were working pretty close with TJPDC, Thomas Jefferson Planning District, on learning more about all of the opportunity zones that, are, that exist in Albemarle County and in the city of Charlottesville and how that positions us for advantages with future economic development partnerships, public and private partnerships. I'll be honest and say that in the last year, Kim, uh, most of the attention and resources and time with the county government on economic development has been with project, re, uh, project rebound and trying to get our businesses, trying to get some of the federal money to some of the businesses to keep them afloat and to move money into the community, uh, trying to sustain some of the businesses that have been hit hardest from the pandemic. Roger and his team are beginning to move and to position themselves to go back into some level of normal work. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we've got a second round. Potentially, we have a second round of, of uh, CARES funding that's going to be coming to the community. And so we're trying to figure out what new normal looks like for us with the emergency. Uh, we're now past one year as of March the 12th. And we're trying to figure out what new normal is going to be helping to sustain our businesses, continuing to sustain our businesses that are hurt the most, but also um, uh, advancing the uh, ideas of opportunity zones and continuing to look for uh, uh, the areas in Albemarle County that may, that may present us with the biggest opportunities with tax-based growth. Um, we do have money, and Nelsie can talk a little bit about this, about the money that we have in the Economic Development Fund uh, we have, um, help me remember, Nelsie, from the presentation, what we I, I, uh, you go, I'm going off of memory, but I thought it was, um, I, I don't want to go off of memory, so let me, I'm going to say the wrong number. Um, we do have some, I thought it was over $2 million. Um, Jeff, does that ring a bell? Just looking in the, I'm going to look in the slides right quick. Okay. And, okay. and while you all are looking that up, let me just suggest that. It's been a couple of years. Roger came to our CAC and talked about economic development. And it might be a great um, idea to have Roger come back and talk about where we are with economic development in, in Albemarle right now and some of what he's looking forward to and looking to. So maybe, um, Michaela, if we can put that on our tickler list for an agenda item in the near future, that might be great. Um, because. He came to us when he was first here, <laughs> and it's probably time to have him back again. It just feels like that with Almar County having two two areas, and I don't I don't know if they're by census track, but there's two areas within Almar County, right. and the one that's in the southern part of the county has a very different makeup than than what this area is within the more urban area. I mean, there's more commercial, there's um, a lot more dense housing different types of housing. It just feels that if there was going to be some kind of model that has evolved once that um, that tax designation happened, then those things kind of have happened somewhere around the country and how that looks and what things work, what things don't work. Um, but it's going to be different for, you know, something in the southern part of the county versus where we sit. And you're right, Kim, in that Almar County has two and the city of Charlottesville has two. So our community ended up with four opportunity zones, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, based on uh, the level of poverty in particular areas. Um, so I, I will, uh, I, I see Jeff and Nelsie look like they're still looking. So, <laughs> but we will add that to an agenda item. I think that would be really interesting for uh, the CAC to hear Roger chat about the opportunity zones and his work. Can we just see if Jane can, is your mute still on, do you think? Or, hmm. Yeah, that's so weird, we can't hear you. Huh? One thing you could try, Jane, is next to the microphone symbol in the left-hand corner, there's a tiny little arrow and you can normally like select whether it's coming through your microphone or, or speakers. And I don't have a ton of experience working through that, but that might be the trick. Julian, do you have any words of wisdom you would like to share? 
I was actually looking. I'm so, I'm trying. I was the moving between two two meetings. I, I oh, let me come in. Um, I apologize. I was mo actually meeting. Come on, uh, there I am. No, where am I? There I am. Um, I was actually moving between two meetings. And so what I was going to sort of answer to to Kim was that there's a couple of ways that, we're, that, that the county is actually looking to sort of bring some energy, particularly around uh, commerce to our area. One, uh, Diantha was able and uh, Jeff was able to sort of get it uh, on the premier circle piece to receive a commitment from the developers that the piece that sits on the high will in fact be dedicated for commercial use. And so that there was the initial thinking on that project that, that the, the uh, road facing piece was also going to be used, was going to perhaps be drip, taken out of the, the commercial inventory and that and Diane has been able to move to do that. And I will also suggest that, while it's not there yet, certainly the, the, um, the newest grocery store that we'll have in, our, in, in the opportunity zone is the Aldi. And then with the work that's coming across the street over in the other one that there we will have too. So we're bringing, we're not only are we bringing sort of well, food, but we're also bringing bringing in hopefully new new opportunities for people to work, and in kind of places that if you stay, if you have some, if you have the ability to stay for long, you actually can move up through through an industry. And then there's another piece of this that's coming that I think that's coming that, that will probably be helpful. While it's not doesn't answer exactly what you're asking, but Diantha and and Jeff have been able to pull together, or we've been successful in security securing two grants. One around transportation and one will focus on the 29 North Corridor that in fact looks at how are we going to be moving lots of people talking about multimodal but in the, in the real kind of sense what's the best way to move if we have something that I'm going to tag in, in broad terms mass transit um, but how would we be able to move people effectively up 29 and then back to where where both either here where we have in our area where we have a large sec uh, a census of businesses, but then completely down into obviously where the largest employer is in, in, in our region, which is the university. So while so while while all of those are disparate actions, the whole idea here there is to try and create a set of opportunities and a, and a set of a set of actions that start to look at how do we provide um, people the ability to move around effectively and not have to be, not be so um, automobile centric if that's if that's possible but also look at how do we how, how do we maintain and keep and many of us have heard that Diantha's Diantha's piece on this we cannot afford to lose continue to lose commercial property in our district because we're the place where we're the part of the county where people say they want to have that kind of action so we need to be really smart about trying to maintain that and we've been pretty good. And then the big McGilla is something here that Mikel has been involved with. And what are we doing about form-based code? So the form-based code over there, which incorporates both, uh, um, sorry, Mikhail, I have to say it, the zombie, the zombie, um, uh, the zombie shopping center, and the one across the street, which is where the the the, the Lytle's going to go. Yeah. When this moves through, as this moves through the the, through the supervisors. There's some opportunities over there to make that something that we, I don't even think we can imagine yet, but with the county's input, um, with the supervisors and the executives input, we might have that, that may be the place that lifts off as far as uh, uh, commercial and, and attracting, pe attracting people here to do work. And then there's also John's, uh, John's shopping center there that, that has some interesting things if the city can let them build some apartments there. If they will do that, we, and with the bridge that Dianth is able to get across 29 from, from Stonefield across there, we just might be able to pull this off. Is that okay, John? Am I allowed to say that, John? Look at John. Am I allowed to say that, John? And I started to mention the bridge when John Lewis was talking because the bridge that we're going, we have secured funding for, that goes across 29 and connects Stonefield and John's area, right? John Neal's area is so exciting it is pedestrian and bike and you won't have you can go from our side and, and do it and the county over to the city and walk or ride a bicycle that's going to be a game changer just yeah. for our community okay john now's your time i'll just say we're always happy to welcome any of y'all support with anything that we're trying to do we really really appreciate you getting behind us all the time for every project we come forward with well, jane is your audio working 
But, no. um, but Julian does reference the two grants that we've received, an Albemarle County centric transit grant that will lay a vision for what transit should look like in Albemarle County in specific areas, and um, 29 North, Pan Tops, and Monticello, meaning the tourist destination. And then we have a regional transit grant that is going to be envisioning transit in our region, greater region. And those working together are really game changers for us, I think, too. And Jeff, did you guys, are you all looking? I think we were going to get back to you. Yeah, uh, Diantha, we'll, we'll get back to you on the economic development fund question. Um, the, there's a couple confusing parts of it that I want to make sure we get the right information. Um, so I'll get back to you all on, on that. Yeah, sure. That's okay. And we'll, and we'll have Roger come talk to us too. So that'll all be good. <laughs> we'll yeah. package him with lots of information. Yeah. <laughs> okay, questions? Okay. Just a couple things about schools. Just want to say that the budget that I look, I presented tonight, our funding request is not the last word. We are also looking at a strategic plan to address learning loss of this past mm -hmm. school year. Uh, that will include some summer school available K through 12, uh, which is much expanded over what it normally is and other uh, perhaps expansion of pre-K and other things that we are considering. Uh, Dr. Haas will be presenting that in April. Um, and then the other issue that we've gotten a million letters about um, is what are our plans for the fall term or the next school year? Uh, Matt will be, Dr. Haas will be making his recommendations on May 6th and the school board will be voting uh, on the 13th. Uh, and obviously the caveats are depending on what the prevalence in our community of COVID is, but uh, we will know a lot more in mid-May. Well, good to know. Anybody else? As we wrap up though, I really want to just thank staff for being here tonight. Yeah. And I also want to thank staff and Jeff and his team for recommending as we went into the COVID emergency that we continue our work and staff worked right on through. We didn't lay anyone off, <laughs> we continued our work. And that has really made a difference in our community in our success of, of moving through this, this, uh, this period and the shutdown at, in, an, in, I would say, a successful as possible way. So thank you. <laughs> Yep, thank you everyone. The, um, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, April 19th from 5.30 to seven. I almost said this at the, at the school, but hello. It was just a little mind blow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're gonna be at the school. You know, and again, the, the public has the opportunity to participate, you know, it'll be posted on the web. And without, if I don't hear anything else, I'm gonna go ahead and just adjourn the meeting and say thank you very much to everyone for being here and for participating. You're a great- Thank group. you. Thank, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Good night.